This is episode 93 of the Real World Wellness Podcast. Hi everyone, I'm Christine Lehman, a certified nutritional therapy practitioner and the Reverse Diabetes Coach, which is also the name of my website. I see clients in person and remotely via Skype, and you can reach me on my contact form. Feel free to request a 15-minute phone consultation. And I am taking a limited number of clients during the summer months. Please remember while you're listening to the show, advice and information we provide is intended to be helpful and informative, but is not a substitute for medical advice or treatment. So I'm excited to announce the beginning of a series on women's hormonal health, specifically the stage of perimenopause, which I will get into in a minute. And I've got some exciting speakers lined up to discuss this various aspects of perimenopause and that will include estrogen dominance and the impact of stress as well as natural remedies and I also hope to line up some more speakers a naturopathic doctor for example to talk about functional hormone tests and bioidentical hormone therapies or BHRT and as well as exercises that are best for women after age 40 and polycystic ovarian syndrome in later life, or PCOS. So let's get started with an overview. And I want to mention that uh, menopause, actually, there are four stages of it, which I wasn't familiar with until I read this. Uh, Premenopause, perimenopause, which is what we're going to talk a little bit more about today and of course that precedes menopause and uh, there's often some confusion around this so I'm glad we're going to talk about it and postmenopause. Now just for the sake of transparency I'm in the postmenopausal stage of my life um, and I was pretty fortunate that I weathered this um, these stages pretty well. I think what caught me a little off guard was it happened earlier than what I thought. I, I, I think a lot of women do this. We tend to look at the our mothers and when they went through it and my mother thought she had gone through it in her early 50s which can be a bit more typical but again it's such an individual thing so um, I was a little surprised. I was kind of done with it by 47 but having been on the other side I can say I don't miss <laughs> the monthly periods and all those hormonal fluctuations. It's actually mm-hmm. kind of um, a nice uh, stage to go through, but it has its own challenges, which we'll talk about more. All right. So, first of all, what um, is considered perimenopause? Um, it is the second stage, as I just mentioned, and it can be recognized as the stage that signals the start of the end of the reproductive years. So I think that part of it can be a bit emotional for women. I know it was a bit emotional for me um, because I had not had children and I thought there was a window where I could still have children and then I realized that that door was shutting. So, um, But everybody's different and um, they usually enter this perimenopause phase in their 40s. And during this time, the female body prepares for the total ending of reproductive functions, which, as I say, causes a lot of changes, both physical, emotional, and even mental. So there are some symptoms, uh, which we'll talk about more, but hot flashes and mood swings tend to appear. And um, also, there are some tests that can be done that can be helpful. Um, You may have heard of FSH, which stands for Follicle Stimulating Hormone Test. So that can help determine if a woman is perimenopausal, as the FSH levels typically increase when women approach menopause. Then there's an estrogen test. Estrogen, by the way, has different names, one is, or different forms. One is called an estradiol test. And this can be performed many times over a period of several days to measure fluctuation. Another one which you may be familiar with too is called thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH test. And that is usually the first test done to detect problems with the thyroid. However, if you've been listening to my previous talks and episodes, you will know that that is not always a reliable 
um, or comprehensive enough way to get at that whole issue of hypothyroidism or possibly hyperthyroidism. So I would go beyond it if you're having certain symptoms um, and just insist on a thyroid panel. All right. So what are some of the causes of perimenopause? Well, on a most basic level, it is a natural process that is characterized by decreasing hormone levels with age. Unfortunately, there's no escape from it. Um, I think that most women kind of intuitively understand that, but it is, it is, there is caused by internal causes, right? There are physical hormonal fluctuations resulting in the visible signs and symptoms of perimenopause. So this, again, is a natu natural process uh, as you age, and it eventually leads to the end of the menstrual cycle. In fact, uh, you're not officially post-menopausal until your very uh, year after your very last period. And the reason for that is there can be a lot of on and off kinds of bleeding and uh, during this perimenopausal phase. So. External causes can be these other changes that can be accelerated or amplified. So these include poor lifestyle habits such as heavy smoking, extreme stress, hysterectomy, and radiation and chemotherapy. So we'll talk about that more in detail in a minute. But let's talk more about the symptoms because it's quite a list and this is one of the most recognizable ways uh, to know that you're going through hormonal changes. So often they start sort of a mild level of intensity and they may come and go unpredictably for months or even years. Some, some of the most common symptoms are fatigue or being tired, loss of libido which can affect your sex drive, weight gain, depression, hot flashes, um, that's very common, night sweats, a roommate of mine had that. Um, I didn't have that. Mood swings, I would say that was more common when I was having periods actually, but it did come up when I was going, uh, starting menopause as well. Vaginal dryness, that was unfortunately, that one really happens after your estrogen levels go down, that is, and that will continue for as you age. Irritability, yep, I recognize that one a little bit. Um, so these, again, are the most common ones, but obviously this is not an exclusive list. You may be experiencing some other symptoms. Some women find that these, their perimenopausal symptoms really disrupt their lives, and that's when you might really want to seek out treatment, and we'll talk about just a quick overview of some things that can help. Uh, alleviate some of these symptoms. Some of this, to be honest, I wish I'd known when I was going through it. Um, and uh, so, but some things I was doing, and it, it definitely helps. But it's okay, you know, to be emotional too. It's sometimes you're just caught off guard by some of this, and uh, you know, it's just, I mean, just think that you're not going to have any mood, any, you know, little mood swings or anything. It's probably unrealistic. All right, so what are some of the um, treatments? So I would put, always start out with lifestyle, um, and then there's alternative medicine, which we'll go through more when we talk about natural remedies, because one of the specialties of the woman that I've um, asked, and, and she's accepted to discuss this, is herbal, safe and effective herbal treatments, not just supplements, but you know other forms of herbs. Um, I, I think also bioidentical hormone replacement is still probably the next level, and then really prescription medication because of the side effects involved. So you really have to think about that. Even BHRRT is not completely without any side effects, but I'll have someone who's more versed in this talk about it soon. So it's important to not only probably write down what symptoms you're having, but to also consider lifestyle changes and then alternative medicine can do a lot to control your symptoms. All right, so 
we've talked about a little bit about what perimenopause is and of course it occurs after premenopause. So the other thing to consider is while many women are fully fertile during premenopause, perimenopause signals the gradual decline of your reproductive functions. So this is related to your ovaries and uh, trying preparing to shut down and it's a natural decrease in estrogen and progesterone levels. Those are the two dominant sex hormones that women have. Men have t testosterone. So that their decrease in in these their hormone in these hormone levels are really the primary cause. And then as far as age goes, there's not a set age for perimenopause to begin. Most women report their first symptoms in their early 40s, with some women beginning perimenopause earlier or later in their lives. As I s said, I, I would say I was definitely in my 40s. Um, surprisingly though, some women begin it as young as in their early 30s. This may be indicative of an early onset menopause or other potential health issues. So if you're in that group, you may want to consult your um, physician or naturopathic doctor to see uh, whether, you know, what's going on with you. Um, but the point is that it can vary greatly. There's, again, there's no set time for you to experience it other than, you know, normally it's what I would consider more middle-aged. Um, and the other thing is, some, in some women, it can start one to two, three years before menopause. However, some people, in some women, it lasts for 10 years or longer, so it gets really stretched out. Um, of course, shutting down your ovaries takes time. That's not an overnight thing, and your body needs time to adjust to the hormonal deficit created by reduced progesterone and estrogen production. So we've talked about the test so you can help figure out what's going on. And also, now we're going to talk more about some causes. So we've talked about, you know, that it is really mainly caused by these decreased estrogen and progesterone levels. And um, so, of course, the female body is very complex. It relies on a very delicate balance of hormones to perform basic bodily functions, including regulating body temperature, releasing eggs, and managing other vital aspects of your health. So your endocrine system really is what regulates your metabolism, and it also is involved in regulating uh, these uh, sex hormones, as they're called. So. When mini perimenopause starts, the body experiences this natural decline, which we've talked about. So there's this fluctuation and gradual decline, and which is why you experience these symptoms. And then uh, there's that really sort of end, you know, the end of your period. So as a result of the low levels of hormones in the body, the ovaries no longer release mature eggs. This sends women into the post-reproductive stage of life, generally beginning in their 40s to 50s. So that's this whole perimenopause stage. However, until menstruation has ceased for one year, pregnancy is still a possibility. So don't assume that just because your period has stopped that you you know, that you're no longer can get pregnant. It's the span is up to a year afterwards. So that's important to know. Okay. Um, so there are some external causes that can really trigger this. And I think this is also important to know, um, especially if any of these apply to you, these lifestyle choices is that they're called. Um, smoking, and of course if you're addicted you may feel like it's no longer a choice, in which case you should try and get some help for that. Um, apparently women who smoke go through perimenopause earlier than women who don't. And this is because the chemicals, and I assume nicotine and cigarettes, lower estrogen levels. Stress, especially prolonged stress, um, can be triggered by you know all sorts of reasons, right? That it's causing 
you know, emotional strain, which has physiological or psychological strain on the body. Um, Post-traumatic stress syndrome is, is a good example. Especially if it, if it goes, it's ongoing, it's chronic, right? So that can cause your body to enter perimenopause earlier than it normally would. And then there's some medical conditions like radiation or chemotherapy. Uh, unfortunately, they can damage the odor and accelerate the occurrence of symptoms. Radiation and chemotherapy, though, do not automatically trigger perimenopause. Depending on your overall health and genetics, some women will either experience symptoms or it's possible that the ovaries will not be greatly impacted and continue to function into a normal range. So it's a pretty individual matter there. Surgery, um, if you've had to have both your ovaries removed, you may abruptly, that may just unfortunately just uh, jumpstart your perimenopausal symptoms. Genetic and autoimmune diseases such as Turner syndrome or thyroid disease can also trigger the onset of perimenopause. So depending on the severity and the frequency you may want to seek help for that. So some of the symptoms I mentioned a few but there's really quite a long list here. Um, and It, and they relate to these four stages of menopause. So premenopause, the symptoms can be different from perimenopause, and as well as menopause from postmenopause. In fact, they're going to be quite different. So it's important to realize that there are some overlap, though, particularly between perimenopause and menopause, which is easy to get confused then. Uh, the main difference between the symptoms of both stages is that menopause marks the point at which the menstruation has completely stopped for a year. So I, I mentioned that earlier, but it's important to remember that. And then really the symptoms depend very, uh, I'm sorry, vary depending on their severity and frequency. So let's go through some of the symptoms. Uh, they can be both, as I mentioned, cognitive or it's another way of saying psychological or mental and physical. Um, and, and not every woman is going to experience all of these either, so that's another important thing, so you don't need to feel overwhelmed um, by this, but it is common to have at least a few of these. So let's start with the, the psychological, um, anger, anxiety, depression, irritability, dizziness, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, and mood swings. And then on the physical side, hot flashes, night sweats, reduced libido, weight gain, urinary incontinence, which just means you don't have as good control over your bladder, uh, vaginal dryness, and bloating. So some of these, you know, frankly, I had some bloating. I had a little bit of irritability, um, depression maybe, fatigue certainly, and some mood swings while I was experiencing my period. So it kind of makes sense that as your body is changing you're going to still experience some of this while you're having your period but then you're going to maybe experience you know experience some other changes as well so those are the most common ones some of the uncommon or more rare symptoms are urinary tract infections i mean i i still get those once in a while and can be treated with antibiotics heavy menstrual bleeding Irregular heartbeat, which I find interesting because I've had arrhythmia most of my adult life. Joint pain. Um, now, I want to be clear, you can have these from other reasons or other causes as well. You can have joint pain, obviously, if you have arthritis or fibromyalgia. So it doesn't necessarily have to be associated with perimenopause, but it may aggravate it or vice versa. Um, bleeding gums and itchy skin. So those are the, some of the uncommon Symptoms, they can be unpleasant and at times painful, but there are treatment op options for managing them. All right, now let's talk about some of those treatment options. And I would just say lifestyle changes um, to start because you can do a lot, which is why I'm a holistic nutritionist with lifestyle. So not surprisingly, some of the same uh, approaches that I use with my clients are recommended here to help you deal with your and manage your menopause symptoms. So, and also of course lifestyle changes is the least uh, risky, right? And there are very few side effects of any that I can think of. 
Um, and then alternative medicines also usually is typically has um, less if to none side effects. They they can have a few, but the main thing is just watching if you're their interaction with medications. Um, but they still can have a few, so you should always research everything or contact a con a, a consultant on this. So let's start with lifestyle. Um, big surprise, a healthy diet is going to go a long way towards helping you uh, deal with uh, perimenopause. And of course it enhances your sense of overall well-being. And along with that, and drinking plenty of water, now I'm going to tell you that anyway. Um, and then as far as exercise, exercising regularly is important. You know, you can get those endorphins, and believe me, you want endorphins when you're going through this. You want that natural high. So um, I would recommend a combination of kind of aerobic and anaerobic exercise. It all depends on where you're at. Again, I'm giving very general guidelines here. Um, with my clients, I, I, depending on where they're at and their journey, I may recommend only low impact. But if you're in good shape, good condition, and you're, you don't have a lot of joint issues or high stress, you may want to just up the exercise so you get um, some aerobic workout there, which is good for your cardiovascular system and so on, and gives you those endorphins. Um, but low impact exercise, of course, can include swimming, which is, is, is refreshing, especially in the summer if you're in an outdoor pool and also is a nice total body workout. It is not so good for bone density, which I've talked about lately, but uh, just walking, you know, brisk walking, uh, light jogging, it doesn't have to be, you're not have, you know, a sprint or a marathon here. Uh, dancing, rhythmic movement, dancing is great if you like Zumba, go for that. And the point is to do it a couple times a week at least. So you also want to make sure you're getting enough sleep. This is also really under the heading of stress management. Um, your hormones really are impacted by your sleep, so as well as stress. So you really need to be getting uh, at least seven hours. I can get by usually on a good seven hours. Quality is important. Please uh, check out my digital detox blog post. Um, I'll make that available in the show notes to understand you know how the importance of having a nighttime ritual and uh, detoxing from all the gadgets and devices and so on uh, and enough time to unwind and get and get into your bedroom smoking can certainly as I mentioned earlier can certainly impact your hormones so you want to if you haven't thought about quitting now is a good time reducing or eliminating alcohol consumption that one's probably a little difficult um, I would say maybe, it depends where you're starting, right? So if you're starting like, you know, the, the rule of thumb here is two glasses of wine. Now I have these shot glasses, so um, I usually use two of those maybe, which is maybe no more than a half to a full glass of wine a night. So I find wine can be dehydrating as well, so I try not to drink two full glasses myself. But if I go out with my girlfriends, I'm, I may have two glasses. So, But you don't want to go over that, and you may want to even consider cutting back a little bit. So those are some of the lifestyle changes that I want to emphasize, because this can make a huge difference in how you feel and your ability to cope with these changes. Um, I know, too, I, I, I kind of think that there's nothing sexier and healthier than a healthy body. So just don't underestimate the importance of trying to live a really healthy lifestyle, especially at this time of your life. And it will help you set the pattern for the rest of your life. So, you know, a healthy diet, which I'm sure you, you get the gist here, is plenty of fruits and vegetables. Um, I would, you know, say ideally organic, as well as gluten-free grains, Maybe going dairy-free uh, dairy in the sense of avoiding casein, just because that can be pro-inflammatory. But you can certainly go for the cultured dairy. Um, I'm, I love my yogurt and kefir, K-E-F-I-R. And that gives me also a good source of calcium. And then you want to make sure you're getting enough protein and healthy fat. Remember, you don't want the unhealthy fats like the hydrogenated oils and trans fats. So 
Anyway, that's something I can help you with. Um, everyone's out an individual, but those are just some broad guidelines. Um, we've talked about exercise. The guideline there is 30 minutes a day, but I would say the CDC says, um, or at three times a week, basically 50 minutes a week. However, you cut it, it's still 150 minutes a week. And most people try to exercise during the week, but it depends. You, what you want to avoid is just being a weekend warrior. It's better to do less and do it consistently. So if it's 30 minutes a day and you can do that five days a week, however you organize that, that's great. If you do three hours a week and for example, I play tennis three times a week and it's typically an hour, an hour and a half. Um, and then I try to do some, um, I do brisk walking, jogging, and some swimming also. So I, especially as I've gotten older, I, I really, to keep my weight and my health, and again, as I talked about, I have early osteoporosis now, very early stage. So I'm really, be, my goal is to be consistent here with the weight bearing and some resistant exercise, which involves some lifting of weights and so on. So if you can work in some weightlifting too, that will help build muscle and it's good for your bones. Okay, so alternative medicine, I'm really going to leave this for um, my guest who is an herbalist and she's going to talk about um, herbs that can help you um, with perimenopause and these plant compounds that are similar to humans and it can replace depleted estrogen and so on and that's sort of along the lines of that bioidentical hormone replacement. And then there are also hormone regulating herb herbs. So uh, we'll have my guest uh, talk about that. And of course you don't want to, you want a combination right, of approaches. You want a healthy lifestyle, see how maybe far you get with that. And then you can always do use herbs and use alternative medicine as well. And then for some reason, um, if that is not working for you, you might want to consider more conventional. Um, and, and there are artificial or synthetic hormones, but they're known as hormone replacement therapy. But I would do it very cautiously because it can increase the risk of cancer, blood clots, stroke, and heart disease. So. Um, you always want to consult a trusted medical professional and I would include a naturopathic doctor because I would again go that route first and then if that's not working for you maybe try and and I would the next step might be an in, or, and or an integrative uh, physician because they will know about the conventional HRT treatments as well as the bioidentical ones so these uh, three levels are not of approaches are not mutually exclusive. You may want to use one or, you know, I would do a start out with the least, what I call the least risky approach, which is lifestyle, then try and or alternative medicine. And then you can always try um, the more conventional route. So that's, I think, all I really have to say today on this introduction of Tim Berry Menopause. And I hope that was informative. And so next episode, I'm going to have a guest, and she will be talking specifically about estrogen dominance, and her name is Kieran Ran, and she's British, so she will have an English accent, I'm going to assume, and um, so I'm looking forward to that interview with her. So stay tuned for that, and have a great, healthy week, everybody. And for those of you in the U.S., happy July 4th. Take care.